Okay, here we're going into the Witz Medical School. We're going to look at uh, look at the bones of a giant that were found in the 1960s in Namibia. This is my old university where I graduated from. And you know what? I haven't been here since 1983 and nothing seems to have changed. It still looks the same. How about that? That is a femur and it's from Berg Arcus in the Atavi Mountains of northern Namibia. We don't know exactly how old it is, but in my uh, experience, having travelled through museums around the world, I have never seen a human femur this big. If you have an explanation as to why one individual should have such a large I'd be interested. Yes, because he was a giant. <laughs> okay. what, what is your, your estimation on the size of this individual? Well, I have wondered whether the, the size relates to ox genes, regulator genes. You can have a gene that's turned on or off um, and it controls growth and development. I'm not a geneticist. But I know about the HOX2A gene in particular. Yeah. And the HOX gene will determine shape and size of bones. And who knows, maybe in an in individual of Homo sapiens, a femur like this one, was given the opportunity to, to develop this enormous size. It's Homo sapiens, being described as Homo Definitely. sapiens. Yes. The whole structure. Yes, it's anatomically modern human. And date ones? We don't know. We no don't way know. of finding No it. way. Unfortunately, miners have been involved with the discovery um, more than it was 40 years ago, I think it was. And <coughs> it was reported that there was more of this individual. Um, and sadly, it wasn't collected um, immediately. Philip Tobias was notified, um, and this was brought to, to, to Witz. But we don't know more other than it comes from the Berg Arcus formation in the Otavi area in Namibia, which has become famous for another reason. Otavi uh, has deposits which are 10 million years old. This isn't 10 million years old. This is Homo sapiens. But in deposits that have breccia, like Stokefontein, sand that's covered bone, um, discoveries were made of various primates going back something like 10 million years and one jaw which was called Otavi Pithecus. <laughs> Otavi Pithecus is an old primate that could be a very distant relative of all humankind going back 10 million years. So that's what Otavi is now famous for but this certainly needs attention. And com the size compared to a human femur? Oh, we can do that. We can yeah. get a... I was going to okay, just put your hand there. Well, I'll beat you to it. I was going to say, put your hand there. <laughs> At least you get some comparison. Yeah. Was this the one that I heard that Lee Berger... Yes, I've got a... ...showed on something? Yes, I've got a photograph of Lee Berger showing this. But it's difficult to determine, you know, until you see it yourself. So you say that it was found in sediments that were determined to be about 10 million years old. That, that, that's in the case of Atavi Pithecus. Oh, Atavi no, Pithecus, not, not this one. Okay. No, no. no. Okay. We don't know recent. how old it is. Here's a, for comparison. Gosh. Oh my God. Gosh. No, that's... That's chalk and cheese. I must get you the other one. Correspond. So I mean, it's like, it's like twice the size. Oh, it's more. Yeah. It's more yeah. than twice the size. Unfortunately, it don't seem to have... Because you know, all of humankind from 
Scandinavia down to South to the South America wow. stories of giants. Well, that's not the wrong side. It's, so is, the, is this the right side that we're looking at? We're looking at the other side. The other side, okay. I haven't been able to find a counterpart. Mm. <clears throat> but yes, you can see the femoral head is so much. So, so, I mean, essentially, if one had to just take a, a, a wild guess, you could say this thing is twice the size of a human. I would say four times. I mean, three times. Would, would, would I be completely out of line? I would say three times. That's fine. We, we, we can do this. And we do that. And we say twice. Oh, twice the size. Yeah, but it's not because its actual volume is a lot more than twice. In, I would well, say four, yes. Three or four times. In terms of the dimension of the femoral head, it's in the order of twice. Twice as this, twice this, yeah. twice this, yeah. all directions. But you're right, volumetrically, it's so four the times. femoral head would be bigger. So he could be four times the height. Very big. Sure. Let's overdo wow. it. Say <laughs> twice. <laughs> Twice is good Twice enough for me, you know. Enough. I don't know so basically, <laughs> so we're dealing with with potential evidence here that there were humanoids or human-like beings running around here that were twice the size of what we are today. Large humans, and I would say within the last hundred thousand years, I would guess because we've got archaeological evidence for the presence of Homo sapiens, the species to which we all belong, mm. within the last ten thousand years, and I'll show you one skull from Border Cave, which is near Swaziland, the border between KwaZulu-Natal and Swaziland. That's in the order of 10,000 years. We've got good evidence for our species, Homo sapiens, within that time frame. So I, I would say that this is less than 10,000. But only 10,000? This is a skull thought to be Middle Stone Age, uh, in the order of 100,000 years or slightly less from Border Cave on the boundary between KwaZulu-Natal and Swaziland. Raymond Dart uh, and Philip de Bias were involved with excavations at Border Cave. We know from the artifacts that this was a time of innovation with new stone tools being used uh, within the last 100,000 years. Peter Beaumont worked at the site the skull had been found in the course of the early excavations. So <clears throat> this is really a specimen of Homo sapiens which is not unlike modern Homo sapiens that we have today. Um, if we had a femur, I should think that the femur would have been similar in size to what I'm holding. We're currently doing a DNA project on this skull. We had three colleagues from Sweden, from Uppsala University, and we sampled milligrams of bone of this skull. And we had a clean laboratory. Normally what you do is you take the fossil to the laboratory and you work in ultra clean conditions. What they did with us was to bring a clean laboratory in the form of a tent. We had the tent situated there. The skull went in and it was then under sterile conditions and be sampled a few milligrams of bone and we are hoping to look at DNA of this individual. Um, we haven't got the results yet but ancient DNA has been found for example in Neanderthals mm. in Europe. Um, as old as that? Mm -hmm. So is there a reason why they haven't tried to sample DNA from the, the big femur? Would you like to work on it? I'm happy to have you as a collaborator. I've got some friends that have got labs that do DNA sampling. This has been understudied. I don't think that it's been studied in, in great detail. It's really unfortunate that we don't have more of it. Yeah. But it's worth pursuing. Yeah. So would you be prepared to, to go down that avenue? Of course. Take And take a leadership in that research? Well, we'd collaborate. Totally different subject. But he also he also dealt with a skull at some stage. I, yeah. Yorick, Yorick, the last boy Yorick, I yes. knew him well. Yeah. So there's a quick question I want to ask you, are we on, on, on this skull? What is your take on the um, on the Boskop skull? That's the other one I asked. Yeah. There is certainly a lot of variability in the species that we call Homo sapiens. And in the time of Robert Brum and Raymond Dart, Various individual specimens were classified, and so there was a Boskop type named after one specimen, which we don't have here. Yeah. Um, there were other varieties, and it, 
we now recognize it today to be part of the variation expected within a single species. Um, but particularly Robert Broom was keen on the boscopoid uh, and other varieties. Um, but we don't use that term anymore. Yeah. Okay. I was fortunate enough when I was at the museum, they took it out. I went with a friend of mine who's a professor at um, the university there and they opened it up. They brought, brought it yeah. from a box yeah. in the vault and it's not even on display. So I was really sad yeah. to see just like this bone isn't on display to show, yeah. wow, look at this yeah. amazing stuff we got here. Okay, well what we are planning to do in our new vault, uh, which will be on the main campus of the university, the Goodbye Front we will have the opportunity to have some specimens in cabinets so we can have uh, dignitaries and the general public coming in on occasion yeah. to see special objects. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you the tongue child which we also have in the little vault. <laughs> this is a serious vault you've got here. <laughs> but you oh, this is fantastic. Do you, uh, no of the oh, it's true. We do that. We have a museum. This is too bad. Well, it is special. Because you haven't researched it yet. So if we, if if we, for example, were to agree to collaborate on some research on sure. this, how would we go about this? To set up a number one, write a little proposal. We right. have this, and we could ask particular questions. Yes. Um, the possibility of getting a date should be considered. Uh, it is mineralized, so the possibility is that we don't have any radiocarbon. Carbon-14 relative to carbon-12 gives us an age up till about 40,000 years ago. My guess is that this is sufficiently mineralized to be probably outside the range of radiocarbon. But there are techniques now using uranium, so why not? We'll put in a proposal to try a date, yeah. and we could do a detailed morphological analysis. That would be a first stepping stone. Yeah. We could try to get an estimate of body size. I've already done this on femoral necks uh, in relation to other dimensions, like the complete femora. Yeah. You know, one of my first projects, way back in 1971, Philip Tobias gave me access to the collection of human skeletons, which later became the Dart Collection. And I had interests in the relationships between the length of the femur and orbit height because we recognized orbit height might be a proxy for the dimension of well body height dimensions and to test it I measured countless numbers of femora in 1971 I was just out of school I was and, at the and did it test. sink up it worked up beautifully that's awesome but 1971 <laughs> you have to remember there were no computers, no. there were no calculators, yeah. and I wanted to publish, and I was just, you know, it wasn't even an undergraduate, I was just out of school, but Philip Tobias and Bob Brain were very supportive, they recognized that I was onto an interesting project, and I was able to show from a drawing that there was a pattern to the results, that there was a relationship between the length of a femur and the height of an orbit. That's amazing. So what you could do is then go to a Mrs. Pleas skull, yeah. Scalopithecus, measure the orbit height and estimate body height. Um, and I, I did have a short manuscript on that. That's and, a fascinating uh, study. I love that. But <laughs> Philip Tobias was very keen. I mean, even though I hadn't begun university, he gave me access to the collections. You were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you were very lucky. Yeah, he and I had, the yeah. I had the support of Bob Brain, and I met uh, Herta de Villiers, who, who worked on this skull at about that time. Herta de Villiers was part of the Department of Anatomy, and I remember coming in and being very much in awe of all these great <laughs> men, <laughs> Raymond Dart, Tobias, and others. And Herta de Villiers turned to me and said, Mr. Thackeray, we are expecting great things from you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it seems like they were right. <laughs>